Welcome to James Madison's Montpelier. I'm Ryan Nobles of NBC 12 in Richmond, and we're continuing our conversation on the Bill of Rights. We're pleased to be joined by a very great group of scholars, including the scholar in residence here at Montpelier, uh, Lynn Uzel. Lynn, thank you for being here. Paul Finkelman is the president uh, William McKinley Distinguished Professor of Law at Albany Law School and a widely published author. Gene Hickok is a former college professor and the one-time Deputy Secretary of Education in the Bush administration. Gene, I want to start with you. Uh, we're going to talk now about the history of the Tenth Amendment. This was another one that was important to Madison. Why did he think this was an important addition to the Bill of Rights? Well, it's interesting because when Madison begins to talk about the Constitution, uh, with the Virginia plan at the convention and so forth, he really has in mind a much more powerful central government than the final constitution that emerges from Philadelphia. There were compromises in that, in that convention. Uh, then as he runs for Congress, for the first Congress, he recognizes after the ratification debates that the issue of national versus state power remains pretty volatile and he begins to be supportive of a Bill of Rights. The Tenth Amendment is important because it's his attempt and Congress's attempt to try to solidify the notion that Washington, the national government, has the powers delegated to it by the Constitution, but all other powers not delegated to it by the Constitution remain with people or the states. It's a very important concept of limited government. And it's interesting at the convention, I mean, in the first Congress, I think it was Tucker from South Carolina, but when he looked at the language of what becomes the 10th Amendment, he wants to have expressly delegated by this Constitution to the national government. Madison opposes that, saying it's difficult to tie the hands of the national government too much. But think about how that might be different if the 10th Amendment actually did say the, word, the government has to have express powers in the document to do this. If it doesn't have it, it resides with the states. And Lynn, was this uh, an example of Madison's love-hate relationship maybe with the Bill of Rights? And, and, and would he have passed the Bill of Rights had the Tenth Amendment not been in it? Well, I think the Tenth Amendment was meant to reassure other people rather than Madison himself. I mean, Madison always believed mm -hmm. that the meaning of the Tenth Amendment was implicit in the Constitution already, mm -hmm. that only the powers that were delegated to Congress were the ones that they could legitimately exercise. A lot of people, however, did not want that understanding to rest in implicit uh, understandings. They wanted something stated explicitly. And Jean's right, this issue of expressly was very important and controversial at the time. And many of the recommendations from the states for what they wanted to see in the 10th Amendment uh, included the word expressly. And that comes from the Articles of Confederation, mm -hmm. which said that um, under the Articles, the Congress could only delegate those powers that were expressly named. And Madison argued in Federalist 44 that that was one of the errors of the Articles of Confederation, that in order to exercise any power, Congress must exercise many subsidiary powers that will lead to the aim that the power is meant to fulfill. And therefore, what was needed was the necessary and proper clause in the Constitution, which is a series of unnamed powers but also still confines the Congress in some way. And would things have been a lot different, Paul, if expressly had been left? Well, we wouldn't have an Air Force, <laughs> or we wouldn't have a space program. We might not have nuclear submarines, although maybe they would come in under the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have a uh, nuclear regulatory commission. Anybody can make their own atomic bomb, mm -hmm. because none of those things would be expressly in the Constitution. I mean, the Constitution, for example, expressly says that Congress can create an army and a Navy. Mm -hmm. If you really took the expressly serious, it couldn't create the yeah. Air Force. Right. There uh, wouldn't be a Department uh, of Education for there wouldn't be a Department right? Of, right. That would not have been a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> it might not be a bad thing. It might not be a good thing. Uh, it might be a great thing. We don't know. Right. But the point is, is that this goes to Madison's notion that you are building a constitution that has to have the flexibility to face the future. And Gene, the Tenth Amendment has become a new rallying cry for folks in the Tea Party, for instance. Are, are, are they uh, using it correctly when they use it as a marching cry? Well, I think it's, it's a cry due to the, their frustration with the size of the national government, the debt of the national government, runaway government, that's paraphrasing them, that's not necessarily my point of view. And they looked at the Tenth Amendment as sort of a sign that things are out of balance, things are out of whack. Uh, to get to Paul's point, and I think it's an important one, the Bill of Rights, is a political compromise. Sure, it's a statement of principles, but it's born of politics. 
I mean, it's one reason James Madison was elected was because he decided to support a Bill of Rights. And he ran against James Monroe, who was not very happy about this new constitution. They're the only two people who run against each other to both become president one day. The other thing is, um, and I want to make sure this point gets out there because it's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, I don't believe that we use the term state rights appropriately. States don't have rights. People have rights. It's really state authority that's up for debate. Mm -hmm. And that authority changes over time. But for a bunch of understandable reasons, this notion of states' rights, which has sort of a pejorative context to it, has sort of colored our conversation really since before the Civil War on balance between Washington and the rest of the country. I think we'd be better served if we looked at how government authority is divided in this country at various levels, how federalism, born of the Constitution and born of the Tenth Amendment, differs over time. And that, will, that, I think, will improve our popular understanding of just where we are and where we need to go. I agree. <laughs> Completely. <laughs>